Good morning, everybody. And welcome to the 13th annual Celebrating Women in Conservation Breakfast. What an amazing turnout. It's so amazing that the weather turned out as well. My name is Corinne Prosk, and I'm delighted to be the CEO of Trust for Nature. And I'm absolutely ecstatic to be hosting this morning's event with my counterpart, Rachel from Bush Heritage. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rachel Lowry, the I'm the appointed CEO, appointed CEO of Bush Heritage. Woo! Thank you. Sir. Thank you. I'm on day 2020. 20. Uh, and I am, ab am absolutely loving getting up every day and working on the towards the vision of protecting healthy country forever with you all. Corinne and I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri traditional owners who are custodians of the lands on which this event is proceeding on today. We would like to also um, extend our respects to Elders past and present and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here today, both in the room and online. So thank you for those on Zoom that are joining us today. Thank you so much. We would also just like to ensure that as a room, we reflect on the fact that the environment and the landscapes that we are all working to protect sit on lands where sovereignty was never ceded. And it is an important um, fact to recognise because it makes the challenges that we all face all the more challenging but also all the more important to traverse those pathways together. Okay, we are thrilled to have more than 500 people here today. It's just phenomenal, so thank you. That's 500 in this building, but then there's all the people online. And I particularly want to shout out to Lizzie and her team, but also the other 130 um, virtual viewers. There's 15 groups outside of this. And there's still a waiting list. So I was telling the minister I've got visions for next year. <laughs> so anyway, our job here is to make your morning on time and slightly exciting because we know that a 6am get up is pretty hard. I was just sharing with someone earlier that the only person who's happy in our household is the dog because they get fed half an hour earlier. <laughs> we hope you've got caffeine, you've got tea and soon you'll have food. We also want to thank Minister Demopoulos for joining here. Um, and for taking part in these important celebrations. This morning, and I'm already taking on her words, but there's the minister is here, but we've also got other members of parliament. I really want to shout out, it's really important to have you all here in the room on this important work, whether it's work on leadership, whether it's on women, whether it's on helping, working with First Nations, as well as protecting our nature. Okay, to kick things off, we would love to introduce Wurundjeri Elder, Uncle Colin Hunter Jr. to conduct Welcome to Country. Cheers. Thank you very much and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honour and a privilege to be here today. My name is Colin Hunter IV. I would like to start off with acknowledging that this morning we are on Wurundjeri Country, home of my ancestors and also home to everybody here today. I would also like to pay my respects to both Elders past, present and emerging, Elders from all nations, especially all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community members here today. Wurundjeri is a part of the Kulin Nation and of the Warung language group. Wurundjeri country extends from the inner city of Melbourne across to the Great Dividing Range, west to the Werribee River, south to the Mordialic Creek and east to Mount Borbore. A big thank you to everybody who has helped make this event possible this morning. Woman Jekka, welcome, and I hope everyone has a fantastic evening ahead. Good luck and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for that welcome. Uh, it's so important to recognise the 60,000 years of history that we are all so proud to be part of. And we look forward to working together for the future. 
So, so I am guessing that we don't need to really tell anyone in this room how hard it can be sometimes to get the good word about nature out there. All of us most likely heard at certain times, stop talking in your echo chamber, bust out of the bubble, go take the message to where the people are at. Well, Corinne and I were talking about two weeks ago, there was a pretty significant event happening in Melbourne. You could say there was a big hype behind, I don't know if you've heard of her before, Taylor Swift, she was here. And we were just talking about how much, <laughs> how much we love everything she stands for. You know, when there's a woman out there influencing a national election, it's worth having a look at what's going on there. Um, having said that, we also confess that between the two of us, we know about two of her songs. So we're not <laughs> real Swifties, even though we think she's absolutely fabulous. Um, we're the other type of Swiftie, yeah, well, you know? Yeah, the bird Swiftie. Well, this is it. <laughs> so we decided we'd take the message to where the people are at, and we are both very passionate about the Swift Parrot, a threatened species that, sadly, we are facing the loss of due to logging in habitat. Um, and a whole range of threatening processes that are avoidable. Uh, and so we just thought today that we would just invite you all into the Swifties for the Swift Parrot Club. Um, so please consider yourselves appointed. <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> all right. Speaking of important eras. See what I did there? No, don't start doing the references now. <laughs> the Tay-Tay references may run through, we'll see. Um, speaking of important eras, though, today is all about getting ahead of International Women's Day and starting to reflect on the importance of genuinely celebrating women in conservation. And what does that look like? We all know it's women out there in the field, going up trees, checking nest boxes. It might be women conservationists sitting at a desktop day in and day out, poring over data, analysing data to make the best decision possible to manage landscapes. We might be talking about someone working and beavering away to try to just crack the code to breed a threatened species so that it's not too late. Or women up there on the hill influencing the men and women backbenchers, still mostly men, um, in parliament uh, trying to get better Policy for conservation. Yeah. Women in conservation are really engaging in such a vast amount of work. Uh, we know that and we're here today to celebrate that. And it does lead me towards asking one of my favourite questions. I love asking people this and I'm going to ask it of you, Corinne. Who inspired you and led you towards the nature path? I was always in, into the great outdoors but I had two childhoods, absolute heroes which most of you in the room will probably know, Jane Goodall and her amazing primate work. And I'm having, I'm taking my dad in June to go and see her because she's here in Melbourne and I want a selfie, potentially with my shirt. Anyway, and the other one who, on a more serious note is really Rachel Carson and the work she did pushing um, the systems and being able to step up in the face of adversity to highlight the impact of chemicals on the environment. Her book, Silent Spring, changed what I wanted to do for my, um, for my, for my employment. But leaders come in all shapes and sizes, as Rachel said, and closer to home, there's many who have inspired me. One of them is actually here in the room, I think. I haven't seen her this morning who I met at university, Cinnamon Evans from Ceres, um, <laughs> who we spent a lot of time trying to work out what the future of nature should be. And I think it may have involved whiteboards, some red wine and some quality camping. There you are. And there you go. And we're still having those conversations. But there's also the teams within our businesses. There's also the, the table of students that um, are here today too. And it's great to see people being inspired as what's possible and the ability to have, um, you know, the desire to change. When um, Corinne asked me the other day who's inspired me and led me to the path that is now a career that I very much love, in all honesty, I didn't have to look far afield at all. And in fact, there is someone that has been a source of inspiration for me for well over a decade now, and I had the immense privilege of working with for over a decade as well. 
And obviously, it's not just a source of inspiration to me, but to many, because just a few weeks ago, she received an Order of Australian Medal. And that person is in this room today. And in the spirit of celebrating women in conservation, we absolutely had to ask you all to join us in recognising Dr Jenny Gray from Zoos Victoria. And in the spirit of celebration and recognition, we wanted to also call out a few other names very quickly that are personal ones to us because Corinne and I are very mindful that we stand on the shoulders of great people who have influenced our organisations that we now have the privilege of leading. And so I just wanted to do a, a big shout out to some of our personal heroes and thanks to Heather Campbell, who's in the room, <laughs> Vic Miles, Karen Alexander, Gail Austin, Sue O'Connor, and I know I'm breaking rank a little here because it's not a woman in conservation, but it's important that we also recognise allies and people who yeah. create space. And I want to also recognise Doug Human, who is a <laughs> great champion for inclusion and social equity. Be worried, ladies. Yes. Potentially, Doug, you may have to wear the Swifty shirt too. <laughs> OK. I promise we won't um, pepper Tay-Tay references into absolutely all elements of today, but you can tell we've, we've been caught by the hype. Um, I now want to introduce the Honourable Steve Demopoulos, Environment Minister of the Victorian Government, to say a few words. Thank you, Steve. Good morning. It's a hard act to follow. Thank you for the energy. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I wanted to thank uh, Colin for the warm welcome to country and um, also pay my respects to traditional owners of the land upon which we meet, the Wurundjeri. And uh, as you said, I think, uh, acknowledging that this, uh, these lands were never ceded, but also that we've got so much to catch up on uh, in terms of learning about care for country. Uh, I'd particularly like to acknowledge the Aboriginal women who are attending today and acknowledge your strength and resilience and contribution to not just conservation, but land rights and many, many other uh, noble objectives. So the knowledge that has been passed on from mother to daughter for hundreds of generations for caring for country and land is really invaluable. And I think we're only just grasping the, um, the gem and the gift we have over the last couple of decades. I'd like to acknowledge, now you said there were a few members of parliament. I've only seen two, not only, if I've seen two. So if I, if I, um, if you see me next week in parliament, I haven't acknowledged you and we're in the same building, I'm sorry. So <laughs> Sheena Watt, um, member for Northern Metropolitan Region and the Parliament Secretary for Climate Action. Ellen Sandell, member for Melbourne and Deputy Leader of the Victorian Greens. And I'm not sure if there's any other Victorian member of parliament here, just yell out. No, okay, good, that's good. <laughs> Uh, last, uh, sorry, I don't think Lisa's here, the Interim Chair of uh, Trust for Nature, and I acknowledge Lisa, obviously Corinne, uh, CEO of Trust for Nature, Sue O'Connor, Chair, and Rachel Lowry, as you know, CEO of Bush Heritage Australia, as well as trustees and board members from Trust for Nature and Bush Heritage Australia. Well, thank you both, thank to both organisations for the, uh, the warm hospitality today, and everybody else. Uh, the energy in this room is palpable. It's my first one, uh, but it's uh, maybe, I think it's about 100 people bigger. Is that right? Uh, perhaps one day we can move across the road. Uh, Rod Laver Arena. <laughs> but could you imagine a breakfast? Uh, women uh, in conservation at Rod Laver Arena, 15,000 people. It's possible. Um, so, and I know somebody who can get us a booking uh, there. <laughs> So it's a real honour for me to be here to celebrate with you this amazing uh, work uh, and recognising International Women's Day uh, next, uh, next week. I want to acknowledge, and again, I risk doing this because I'm only fairly new to this space, so there are very uh, good, uh, excellent leaders who I'll get to meet. But if I haven't acknowledged you, this, is, um, this list is, if it's insufficient, it's Sarah's fault from Deca, Sarah Harbage. I'm kidding, Sarah, it's not your fault. But Anna Rose, CEO of Environmental Leadership Australia, Dr Jodie Gunn, CEO and Vic Miles, Chair at the Australian Land and Conservation Alliance, Heather Campbell, CEO at Greening Australia, Jennifer Walcott, Walcott 
Victorian Environment Assessment Council, Fiona Sutton uh, Wilson, CEO at Earthwatch, Lisa Palmer, CEO at Wildlife Victoria, Annabelle O'Neill, Deputy CEO of Greenfleet, and Kelly O'Dwyer, former Federal Minister for Women. And I think Kelly is somewhere here, and I saw Kelly recently. Um, and who can forget that Landcare was started by two remarkable women, uh, Joan Kerner and Heather Mitchell. This work is being continued by the wonderful Claire Hetzel and Jane Carney here in Victoria, and nationally, uh, Doug and Shane. Um, I'll only be brief, but I wanted to say that in terms of preserving our biodiversity and wildlife, um, to say to you in this room, it's an ongoing challenge, is to, start, is to state the obvious. Being about five months into the role, I've met some of the most passionate and dedicated people in this sector, smart people who are working every day to prevent the decline of our ecosystem, and, not, uh, and many of them do it, do it as a full-time vocation, but others do it because um, they feel compelled uh, to beyond, uh, beyond their normal work life. I've met with groups like Glancare, like Zoos Vic, and I want to acknowledge Jenny and her um, OAM and, and, sorry, the Order of Australia and the incredible work she's done for over a decade at Zoos. Organisations like Trust for Nature, Environment Victoria and others. There are two things that stand out to me from all the organisations I've met. They care deeply about protecting our environment. It's really a selfless, altruistic motive and they're all absolutely committed to working in collaboration and uh, with government, across partners, across civil society for a sustainable future. Nature loss is being recognised across the world as a priority by governments, businesses increasingly, and a whole host of environmental and non-government organisations and individuals. I think, in reference to your comment, I think, Rachel, um, the echo chamber, I think the echo chamber is disappearing uh, in this in, uh, in terms of the environment policy champions and advocates because it always takes a few people to start the movement over many decades and then you turn around one day and most of the community is with you because it's so obvious, a need and an imperative. So nature loss is being recognised globally uh, but needs to, we need more work obviously. This shared understanding is pushing all of us to look at new and innovative ways to halt and reverse a nature loss. It's underlying the importance of collective leadership and collective action, which women are generally much better at, um, and at ways to shift the dial so we can work together. We've been working collaboratively, collaboratively with the Commonwealth Government to boost this progress with species like the lead-bed opossum. Uh, the lead-bed opossum was incredibly rediscovered in 1961 and has been the focus of significant research and collaboration over the last 30 years. Um, and Tanya Plibersek will be here in a few days for another um, announcement on uh, other collaboration we're doing together between the Victoria and the Commonwealth. We're making some progress through Biodiversity 2037, our 20-year action plan launched in 2017, uh, which aims to improve the health and natural environment as well as the health of our communities through their connection to nature. Since 2014, the Victorian Government has put $580 million towards protecting biodiversity and the natural environment. And I don't say that because I think we should be applauded. I say that to show that there is absolutely a commitment and we need to do more. But making sure we have the necessary funding to protect our environment is just one element of creating a sustainable future. The key ingredient, frankly, is the movement. And the movement is, many of the, much of the movement is represented in this room through people like you and your organisations. The ongoing work that your organisations do every day the innovation, the collaboration, the research, the tangible outcomes is what helps move the needle. It's our responsibility as a government, of course, to continue an ongoing leadership in the environment space and protect the environment for future generations. Through our Nature Fund, we've allocated $13.5 million for high impact conservation projects that have co-investment from private groups to help drive collective action for threatened species and their habitats. And that's part of the work with the Commonwealth that Tanya's coming down next week for. And in the delivery of our $77 million bush, uh, bush bank program, we're working with private landholders to regenerate 20,000 hectares of private land across Victoria, creating vast new areas of wildlife habitat. We're continuing to invest in Trust for Nature to protect some of the Victoria's most critical habitat on private land. We have a strong agenda from creating more open space for Victorians to protecting our coasts, from developing a reliable waste system to improve our, uh, our biodiversity outcomes. 
we know it's critical to halt species decline and protect our flora and fauna. But it's just as critical that private business and private landowners join us, and many are, and match our commitments as we move forward. One third of Victorian land is public. We're 3% of the Australian land mass, and one third of that 3% is, uh, is um, public. The rest of it is private land and landowners. So it's really important and critical that everybody is uh, on the journey. Nature and biodiversity doesn't distinguish land, uh, land tenure. It's also our responsibility in government to support the community in understanding what small everyday things that they can do to support their environment. We want a larger base of everyday champions who are contributing in small but impactful ways to the health of the planet, whether that be planting native trees in their front yard or native flora or preserving local wildlife or returning plastic bottles through the container deposit scheme, lifting one billion containers from the uh, waterways of parks and, uh, and the streets of uh, the Victoria or managing invasive species on their land. So just in terms of that growing the championship base, I was having a conversation um, at the table, at the breakfast table, about organisations uh, representing this room, but organisations also like Footy for Climate. So taking what um, is traditionally probably not leadership in environment, uh, football, and I'm not saying they, they had no interest, but to take that passion and then bring that to the environmental agenda and that's happened in many, many other ways as well, uh, through many different fora, from business to NGOs. Um, and it's really, really important. And I think if I reflect, uh, and that's as dangerous as it is, reflecting on um, the Premier's uh, thinking about my portfolio, she uh, has a real passion in terms of uh, giving a greater sense of ownership and custodianship in some respects uh, to all Victorians around the natural environment. There was no accident that she chose to give the portfolios of tourism, outdoor recreation, sport to the same person that also proudly holds the environment portfolio. She wants to build a bigger base of champions for the environment. And we can do both those things together we can actually allow people to recreate on public lands in a way that's respectful of the ecosystem in particular parts of that uh, public land estate, but also protect the environment. And there, through doing that, we build a bigger championship base as well of people who love the environment and care for it and nurture it. And um, the, we've, uh, as you know, we've ended native logging uh, harvesting uh, and the, dis the <laughs> and that's obviously uh, an applause for the Victorian community and the advocates and a bit for the government too. We're all part of it, but it's definitely a victory for uh, the community and for future generations. But we have an unprecedented opportunity to take that former parcel of land that was, sorry, the former allocation order for logging, the timber harvesting, together with the existing state forests and national parks. We have a, um, a gift the size of Tasmania in Victoria uh, that future generations uh, will hopefully be able to enjoy. Uh, and we have an opportunity this year, we're about to announce in the next few weeks, a uh, panel of uh, good people who will lead a community conversation around what we do in that area and how we make the best use of that incredible gift uh, of that land. In conclusion, um, as the first male environment minister in about a decade, you don't hear that too often, do you? <laughs> you hear the first female X, Y, Z, but this is the first male in about 10 years. That's a good thing. Um, that it's been, you know, it should be more, because it's been a couple of decades. But nonetheless, I'm not a stranger to the immense strength that women have in the environment space. Two of them still sit in the cabinet um, in the same room uh, every Monday. Uh, from the smallest communities on, to, the, on the global stage, so to the global stage, women are driving positive change across the conservation landscape, including the fact that we have only the second female premier in Australia's, sorry, Victoria's history, 167 years of white political history in Victoria. We have the second female um, premier. 
I do have to correct you on one thing, though. Uh, with the election of Eden Foster in Mulgrave a few months ago, the Victorian Parliament has hit 50% women in the whole parliament. <laughs> oh, sorry. Rachel did say up on the hill. We're on a bit of a hill at the end of Burke Street, so I wasn't sure. <laughs> I think our hill is far more important than the federal one. But nonetheless, um, <laughs> so we've hit 50%. We've hit about two thirds of women in the Victorian cabinet. Um, so we are well, uh, well where we should be and hopefully stay that way. But nonetheless, I, I think enough for a guy talking. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, it's, a big, it's a big and important uh, forum uh, for Victoria, but it's also a big and important forum for the job that I hold, and I really appreciate you giving me the time. I look forward to meeting many of you over the course of my work. Thanks so much. Thank you, Minister, and cheers to the dissipation of that echo chamber. That's very much needed. And also to the, the big, bold move like ending native timber harvesting in Victoria. They're the type of bold moves that we need right now, so thank you. Uh, um, Corinne and I would also like to offer our deepest gratitude to our three fabulous event sponsors this morning. Lord Mayor's Charitable Trust, who you'll find over on table 30, the Project Delivery Experts and TBA, TBH Consultancy at table 15, and Leading Land Management Group, Casina Environmental at table 28. Thank you all so much. Okay, well, I'm about to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning, and I will just say, I first met our keynote um, about a decade and a half ago, I was a fellow at the Centre for Sustainability Leadership and she had come to speak about her incredible work at the Australian Youth Climate Coalition at the time. And the universe keeps putting us in one another's orbit because a few years later we had a mutual friend who invited us out to the forest in the Otways to wear muted pink dresses to be part of her bridal party and we were asked this one favour, which was to learn the dance in the Dirty Dancing movie <laughs> and be part of a flash mob. And so Anna and I found ourselves in the middle of the forest and after the rehearsal, our beautiful friend came up to me and said, yeah, dancing's not your thing, Rachel. You can go to the back, that's fine. I won't mind if you're right at the back. But I noticed that you were centre stage, Anna, and so I'm gonna invite you to centre stage once again. I'd like to introduce Anna Rose, CEO of Environmental Leadership Australia, who will be speaking today on leadership for climate and nature, a new approach. Thanks, Anna. Thank you, Rachel, and I promise there'll be no dancing today. I would like to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri traditional owners of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and also extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. First Nations people have cared for country for time immemorial, and we have so much to learn from their incredible leadership in conservation. I also want to acknowledge the elected representatives, the Honourable Steve Demopoulos, Minister for the Environment, Sheena Watt, Parliamentary Secretary for Climate Action. Isn't it great we have a Parliamentary Secretary for Climate Action? Ellen Sandal, the member for Melbourne and the Deputy Leader of the Victorian Greens, and also the former Minister for Women, Kelly O'Dwyer. I spend a fair bit of time working with politicians and, and have done for several decades, and I see how much they sacrifice to go into politics and for all of their public service across the political spectrum in all parties. So thank you for being here today and thank you for all of your leadership. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and thank you also for Bush Heritage and Trust for Nature for bringing us together at a moment like this. It takes a lot of work to create a space like this. And, you know, I understand it sold out well in advance and there was a waiting list, so it's really just like a Taylor Swift concert in that respect. Don't worry, I'm not going to start singing either. Maybe there'll be some ticket scalpers outside, though. But thank you to all of the organisers today for bringing us together. Let's give them a round of applause, too. And I 
also want to thank all of you because it is so beautiful to look out and see all of your faces, so many of you, and think about how many collective hours of your time in this room have gone into conservation, protecting country, protecting our incredible nature, standing up for action on climate, and also how many more hours you're going to give to this work. It will be the work of all of our lifetimes and we'll be doing it together. So I hope that today you meet someone that you haven't met before who you will end up going on and collaborating with or partnering with over the course of our work because we are so much stronger together. I was asked to share my story of how I got involved in this work. And to be honest, it feels like a million years ago. But if you take your mind back to 1997, so to jog your memory, the songs that were topping the charts at the time were Barbie Girl by Aqua, <laughs> Candle in the Wind by Elton John, and Tub Thumping by Chumbawamba. <laughs> Nowhere near as good as Taylor Swift. The teenagers of today don't know how lucky they are. So I'm back then a 14-year-old high school student. I'm in year eight. Um, I'm sitting in my science class. And to be honest, I'm not paying that much attention because I'm not really into science and maths. I'm more into English and sports and socialising. But I remember my teacher putting a diagram on the board and it was about something called the enhanced greenhouse effect. It was about carbon dioxide molecules trapping heat in the atmosphere and humans emitting more of them from burning fossil fuels. Now, it sounded very sciencey, so I started to tune out. But then she explained that those carbon dioxide molecules were trapping extra heat, which led to longer and hotter droughts because the water that was meant to be in the soil was going up into the atmosphere. And when it did rain, you would get more intense flooding because that water that was meant to be in the soil was up in the air and then it all came down at once. And she was talking about something that meant something to me because even though I went to school in Newcastle and grew up there, my mum's family were all farmers. So I had spent a lot of time on my grandparents' farm in the Liverpool Plains and my uncle's farm in Moree and other properties that uh, belonged to various aunties and uncles in the Hunter Valley around Singleton where my mum grew up on a dairy farm. And that year where I learned about climate change in school was right at the start of the millennium drought which just went on to devastate communities and families that I loved and landscapes that I saw drying up. You know, I remember later on talking to a seven-year-old little girl who'd never seen rain. And so I learned about these issues. You know, then I went to my geography class and learned about plastic pollution and biodiversity loss and nature loss and, and felt very, very overwhelmed for probably a year just learning about these issues and not knowing where to start. Has anyone ever had that feeling of just powerlessness in the face of all of what we're facing? A few hands. But then someone came and, and gave a speech at my school from an environment group, a local environment group, and they said something that really stuck with me, which was, start where you are. I mean, it sounds so simple, but it unlocked something in me. And I thought, okay, I'm in high school. I'll set up a high school group. So I set up a little group called the Merriweather Greenies. I obviously didn't know anything about marketing or communication back then. <laughs> and I thought, how am I going to get someone to come, you know, to my meeting? I'm going to have a meeting of the Greenies at the school. And I realised I had to tell people about it, so I got up at school assembly and gave a little talk. And I was terrified. I was very out of my comfort zone and I'm gonna to come to this concept of comfort zone in a little bit. But my only previous experience public speaking before I did that was in year seven, our English teacher had made everyone do a speech. I was so terrified I started crying and she made me keep going. Thank you, Mrs. Clack. No PTSD there at all. <laughs> so, I was, I was terrified, but I did this talk and held a meeting and people came along. And maybe it was because I gave a great speech or maybe it was because I offered free Tim Tams. I will never know. <laughs> but soon we had this little group 
uh, of students at our school and we did recycling. You know, our school didn't have recycling. We set that up. We set up composting. We revegetated large parts of the school with native plants. Soon we had opposition. A group set up called the Merriweather Industrialists. <laughs> So remember, I went to school in Newcastle, world's biggest coal export port. It was an industrial town. They put up posters around the school to advertise their meetings. But we got on with things. We didn't really pay much attention. And we achieved really great outcomes. We made our school more sustainable. We got involved in community advocacy. We met with politicians. We actually changed things. And it made me realise that in Australia, we are so lucky because we don't have to wait for change from the top down we can create change from the bottom up. And that's not the case in every country. So I think that really taught me that when people come together and collaborate, you can achieve great things. I ended up moving to Sydney. I got a scholarship and studied arts law up there. And I got involved in the environment group on campus. And again, we did things to start where we are. We made our university more sustainable. We held a student referendum. 97% of students said they wanted more renewable energy. Um, they wanted our university to be powered by renewable energy. Now, that doesn't sound controversial now, does it, in 2024? The idea that you'd power a university by renewable energy, by sun and wind. But back then, our vice chancellor went on national radio and said, green power was a hoax. <laughs> so things change. And we helped move that conversation along. And in fact, many universities at the time, and that's how I met um, Ellen Sandal, was through that movement of students who were helping make their own universities more sustainable and building this movement of young people who were passionate about it. I co-founded an organisation, as Rachel mentioned, called the Australian Youth Climate Coalition. It's also how I met Sheena. And so many young people were passionate about it and, and got involved. Uh, and that was a real honour to be part of that organisation for, for many years. But I retired at the ripe old age of 27, which felt very old, and ended up doing this documentary project with the ABC where I was asked to participate with the former finance minister, Nick Minchin, in a four-week journey where we had a conversation and I tried to help him understand the, the science of climate change and he tried to convince me that it wasn't happening. And it was a really important turning point for me, that conversation, that dialogue, putting myself in his shoes and spending that time with him. And I, as I said, maths isn't my strong point, but I did just do some maths this morning and calculated that at the time of doing that, I had been involved in conservation for about 13 years. But that was also 13 years ago. So it was really the midpoint of all of the time that I have now been involved in conservation and environment and climate work. But spending that time with Nick, and you know, we didn't agree on everything, uh, but we were able to have a constructive and respectful conversation. And at the end, we were able to agree that there were many reasons to transition towards renewable energy for our economy, even if you weren't doing it for a climate change reason. And I wrote a book about it called Madlands, A Journey to Change the Mind of a Climate Skeptic. And you know, it, it was a key turning point because it was the first time that I'd really, you know, we spoke about echo chambers earlier. It was the first time I'd really deeply gotten out of my echo chamber. And so it was an immensely valuable experience for me to understand where he was coming from and to do so in a respectful way. I did a book tour after that, after I'd written the book. And, and I went, I spent about six months on the road I did 250 talks um, to schools, to councils, community organisations, small businesses, uh, outer suburban areas, rural and regional areas, places where a kind of climate change author doesn't normally get the chance to go. And I'm very grateful to Rob Purvis and to Dick Smith for making that possible. I took six young people along with me and all the volunteers that hosted us in their homes and spare rooms and sheds along the way. And it really cemented after that time this sense that I had had that we have to get out of the bubble and we have to have not just um, talking to other people but listening and having really genuine dialogue, including with people who had a real diversity of political views 
you know, my family, National Party voters, they were farmers, and that had instilled in me this sense that everyone wants the best for our country, no matter who you vote for. Like, you have to assume good intention and, and start from that place. So it made me realise and look back on some of the work that I'd done previously and some of the campaigning work that I'd done previously and think about how that would have been received by Conservative voters or Conservative MPs and think about some of the things that I'd done actually probably doing more harm than good and, and not being a welcoming space to bring people in. So to cut a long story short, I ended up co-founding an organisation called Farmers for Climate Action, which was a really beautiful experience because it connected me with what had made me passionate about the environment in the first place, which was spending time on farms in nature as a child. And also, you know, the reason I got involved in climate specifically, which was learning about the impact that climate change was having on agriculture. And at the, at the start of that journey, I was worried about what it was doing to farmers. And then, of course, we realised what it's doing to food. And every single food that you have eaten this morning will be affected by climate change. So Farmers for Climate Action was about, I was heavily pregnant with my son at the time, so I know how old it is, it's eight years old now. And in that time, um, Farmers for Climate Action has recruited 8,000 farmers, and that's quite close to 10% of the Australian farming population, I'd say would be on track to get that in the next year. <laughs> farmers for Climate Action has changed the position of the National Farmers Federation on Climate. I remember the first meeting that I had with some of the team there um, about not nine years ago, probably just before we set it up, um, where they said they were on the fence about the science of climate change. I said, well, that sounds like an uncomfortable place to be, <laughs> sitting on a fence. Uh, but, you know, they wouldn't even take a photo with our farmers because it was such a politically toxic um, environment at the time to be talking about it. And so things have changed. Um, farmers for Climate Action worked with NFF and NFF ended up backing Australia signing the Global Methane Pledge to reduce methane 30% by 2030. Um, and right now FCA, Farmers for Climate Action, is right at the heart of the national conversation about how we upgrade our energy system to wind and solar and away from fossil fuels, but doing so in a way that respects landholders and the regional communities that host them, which is so critical. And I, if you can indulge me for a minute, I just want to shout out to all of the incredible women that have been involved in Farmers for Climate Action, despite agriculture and agri-politics in particular being such a male-dominated space, Farmers for Climate Action has always been led by women. Our first CEO, Verity Morgan-Schmidt, from the Western Australian Wheat Belt, XWA Farmers Federation. Our first chair, Lucinda Corrigan, a very well-respected cattle breeder near Albury. Um, our co-founder, Anika Molesworth, from a sheep station out in Broken Hill. Fiona Simpson, who's just finished up as National Farmers Federation president. She was right there at the founding summit of Farmers for Climate Action. Uh, our former CEO, Fiona, Do Fiona Davis, who's just handed over to our new CEO, um, Natalie Collard, who's former head of Australian Dairy Farmers. So all of these incredible women working in such a male-dominated space, often out of their comfort zone, but achieving incredible things. So that, that success around Farmers for Climate Action you know, having grown it, and I was there at the beginning, but it's, it's the, the farmers and particularly those women I mentioned that really drove it forward. Um, that led to setting up a new organisation in partnership with the Maya Foundation, and I want to shout out to Jane Thomas from the Maya Foundation who is sitting over there at the back. Um, and also I believe Annabelle Maya is here as well, and if there are any other Maya family members, you're such a big family, so it's possible I'll miss someone, but thank you so much because that's been an incredible partnership um, to both with Farmers for Climate Action and Environmental Leadership Australia um, that we set up together. And the focus at Environmental Leadership Australia is really taking that realisation I had after that journey that Nick and I did together and thinking, well, how can we engage better with conservative community leaders, conservative voters and conservative members of parliament, particularly in the Liberal and National parties? And it shouldn't be unusual because after all, the root of the word conservative is to conserve. And for me, it makes total sense, but it does sometimes raise eyebrows, particularly you know, with people that I, I was with at the start of my, my environmental journey, which was probably more traditional environmental advocacy, the work that I'm now doing in this conservative space. Um, and you know, it's such a shame that nature and climate policy have become a political football in Australia, and it, it doesn't have to be that way, and we are starting to see changes in this space. Because the challenges 
that we're facing with nature and climate are so complex and they need all of us. We will not get lasting solutions if one side of politics makes progress but then another side gets in and winds it back. And we know how unpredictable Australian politics can be. And for progressive governments, you know, if they're facing a fear campaign from a conservative opposition over nature and climate policy, then it's very hard for them to be focused on acting in line with the science because they have to be focused on the politics. And when I think about the timeframes that we're working with here, I know all of us involved in this work probably wake up every day thinking about the urgency of these challenges. So these challenges are urgent, but they're also long-term. On the urgency, we all know we have six years left before the end of this critical decade where we really have a chance to turn things around before we hit those tipping points in our Earth's atmosphere that will be irreversible. And for the parents of school-aged kids in the room, that's only six more summer holidays. I had some farmers say to me, six more harvests. My son is now eight. He's going to be 14 in six years. And that's the same age I was when I became an environmental advocate. But he will not have the chance that I've had and, and do still have and all of us in this room have to turn things around in the time we have left. Because once the Arctic ice has melted, you can't refreeze it. Once the Amazon rainforest has burned, you can't put that carbon back in the atmosphere or restore that ecosystem. Once Greenland's permafrost has melted and released all of the methane, you can't put that back. So we have this urgency that drives all of us. Every minute that we spend doing the work that we're doing this decade, or every dollar that we spend this decade, is worth 100 times more what we could be doing in the 2040s, 2050s, 2060s. So we have to act now. It means that whatever political parties and elected representatives are in parliament now or about to be in parliament have an immense challenge and opportunity because the decisions and laws that they pass are going to have implications for Australia and the rest of the world. Remember, we're the third largest fossil fuel exporter in the world for generations to come. But these challenges are also long term. And while we can and must get carbon emissions down as quickly as possible to prevent these tipping points, this work is a lot deeper than a solar panel. And the work of really turning our systems towards sustainable and regenerative ones is going to be the work of our lifetime and many lifetimes. And the long-term nature of this part of the challenge means that we require policy approaches and political support that is resistant and resilient to political and economic swings. So between now and 2050, Australia will be governed federally by nine houses of representatives, nine half senates, and at least four or five prime ministers, and that's assuming each prime minister lasts two terms. There will be 48 elections at state and federal levels between now and 2050. So any strategy predicated on sustained periods of one party holding power is extremely unlikely to succeed. And any strategy based on ratcheting up climate policy gains as the two major parties trade leadership and attack each other on climate from opposition is just too slow. So I truly believe that after two decades, it's been almost two decades of divisive, bitter climate wars in Australia, we have to break that division and foster more bipartisanship if we're going to secure lasting progress. Now, there is really good work that's starting to happen at state levels in particular, and it shows it can be done. So I'm from New South Wales, and the conversation in our start state parliament is so much more constructive than what it's ever been in the past. So for example, our former New South Wales coalition government was ranked by WWF as number one on their scorecard that compared state and territory action on climate change and renewable energy. And even after they lost the election, the New South Wales Coalition introduced legislation to ban offshore oil and gas. And I'm really delighted to say that Labor has now gotten on board with that and has introduced their own version of the legislation, which will pass with support from, I think, everyone in Parliament except One Nation. So the Greens, Labor, the Coalition, the Crossbench, everyone is now supporting that. And we saw the same thing happen in our state Parliament with our emissions reduction targets. 
So we had bipartisan support for a solid uh, target around 2030, and then the coalition introduced amendments to Labor's bill to actually ratchet up the ambition to introduce 75% by 2035. Labor government got on board with that, the Greens got on board, the crossbench, again, we've seen this support from across the political spectrum. And it can happen because you had the right of politics introducing it and not weaponizing it. So I wanna really commend everyone that was involved in that on all sides of politics. You know, the people that I have really had the honor of working with um, inside the New South Wales Liberals in particular, uh, Kelly Sloan, Matt Keane, um, Jackie Munro, James Griffin, um, and of course, the Labor government, the Greens and the crossbench for, for working on it together constructively. So it's a real honor to have been involved in that work along with lots of other community organizations, particularly Surfers for Climate on the offshore oil and gas work and the business sector because the business sector realizes, and I know there are many people here today from business, but business realizes that we need a stable policy environment in order to build you know, the amount of renewable energy that we need in order to create um, the lasting progress that we need so that we can keep the lights on as increasingly aging and unreliable coal-fired power exits the grid. We need to build these renewables, not just for the environment, but for our energy security and business understand that. So we do have a success story in New South Wales, but it does still sometimes raise eyebrows amongst some environmental advocates when they hear about my focus on working with that conservative voter base and conservative politicians. But I wanna leave you with a concept that I hope will be practical and useful for all your work, whether it's in the political and advocacy space um, or in your conservation work, that I think has been really key to the work with Farmers for Climate Action, the work in New South Wales, the work with conservative leaning community leaders that I've been doing over the last decade. And it's the concept, I think we have a slide about it, um, it's about comfort zones. Now, I Googled this this morning. I Googled, because you know this is quite a common concept. You've probably come up with it before, before in your work. And I Googled, you know, stretched zone. Um, and I got this image from a um, horse riding with confidence website. <laughs> so it's applicable to all of your activities, <laughs> both in conservation and in recreation. Just keep it in mind next time you're on a horse. And... This has been really, really valuable to my work. And I think, you know, touching on the theme of, of women in conservation, this really spoke to me, you know, as a female leader in this space, because I think women and gender diverse people are really used to having to operate outside of our comfort zones, because so many spaces that we work in have not been designed with, with our comfort in mind, whether that be you know, working in an office block that uh, has the air conditioning set for men in suits, or going into a meeting where you're the only woman and there's a sea of male faces and you're kind of wondering, do I fit in here? Yeah, there's, I mean, who's had that experience of feeling like out of your comfort zone because, you know, because you're not male? A few of us. So I think actually women are really good at getting out of our comfort zones because we do it all the time. Um, but the most high impact work I've done in, in the climate and environment space, oh, we should, we should keep the diagram for a, one more minute because um, I haven't explained it. I mean, I suppose it's somewhat self-explanatory, but your comfort zone is where you feel comfortable. That would be you in the audience right now, probably not me up on stage. Um, your stretch zone is where, you know, you're pushing yourself, you're doing something that's a bit new and it's different um, and it's challenging you you're learning, you're probably making mistakes, um, but you can feel it, right? It's like when the horse starts to trot. I actually love ride, riding horses, so I'm, I'm probably still in my comfort zone, but um, the panic zone is the galloping, if you are not an experienced rider. And it might be those moments where you just feel like, I am out of my depth, where is the exit? <laughs> so we know what that feels like as well. Um, on climate and nature and all of the challenges that we face, in our work and that we will face over the course of our lifetimes, we're gonna be thrown a lot of stretch things to be working with and, a, and probably a lot of panic things to be working with as well as we get more extreme weather events. But that stretch zone where you are able to have conversations and collaborations outside of your comfort zone is so critical to making progress to getting out of the echo chamber, to reaching across divides. And I think 
if I can reflect on the early days of Farmers for Climate Action, I went to a lot of agriculture events with the other farmers that were involved in those early days. And, you know, my mum's family are farmers, but I'm not a farmer. And so it, it wasn't my comfort zone. But I went to, to lots of agricultural events to have conversations um, with the farmers that were leading already on sustainability and those that were not engaged at all. And some of those conversations were really challenging, like that one with the National Farmers Federation, where you know they, that, was, that was probably panic zone for both of us, if I can be honest. Um, I think conservation requires conversation. And the deepest conversations that we can have that will move this work forward are in that stretch zone with people that may share different backgrounds, different political perspectives, different values, but we all share this planet. So start with finding that common ground and then build on it. You know, I think about some of the situations that I've been in in the last decade, you know, going to the New South Wales National Party Conference, going to the Federal National Party um, events, having conversations with people who were not yet there on climate, but being willing to engage. It's so important. And don't ever give up on people. So John Darley, uh, I've never met him, but I'm going to do a shout out to him. He is a conservative politician from the South Australian State Parliament. He, for all of his life, up until relatively recently, did not accept the science of climate change. At 82 years old, he got up in state parliament and made a speech saying he was wrong. He had listened to some scientists on the ABC Q&A science special, and that, along with a few other factors, had made him realise that he'd changed his mind and he wasn't afraid to, to do a speech about it at 82 in the parliament. There are many stories like this. Republican Congressman Bob Inglis, similar story, had spent his, his career um, opposing climate action. And he changed his mind also later in life, not at 82, at a bit younger, but he went snorkeling on the Great Barrier Reef. He learned about the ice cores in Antarctica and he had a conversation, well, actually a few conversations, but one of them was with his son who said, Dad, I'll vote for you, but only if you clean up your act on the environment. Now, that's, that's, a, that's a stretch zone conversation for both of them. If people come to climate and nature and become advocates later in life, it is so critical that we, as the conservation movement, welcome them with open arms, not judging, like you did wrong things earlier, or what are your real motives? But we have to be inclusive and we have to say, that's fantastic. You know, we need everyone. It is never too late to, to come and stand up for nature and the climate. My favourite book when I was younger was To Kill a Mockingbird. To Kill a Mockingbird. Who has read that book? So many of us, right? And Atticus Finch's lines around never judging a man until you've walked a mile in his shoes. It really resonated with me. And when I reflect on my, my earlier work in the climate and nature space, I, I just think I did too much judging and not enough listening. So we need our elected representatives from all sides of politics to exercise transformational leadership, to collaborate and reach outside of their comfort zones and get into their stretch zones, to turn things around in the time we have left on nature and climate. But they also need us to do the same. We can't expect them to be willing to try new approaches and to change if we aren't either. We are in a crisis, but in a crisis, we need to turn towards each other, not on each other. And thinking back to my high school days, I probably should have sat down with the Meriwether industrialists. And I reckon being in Newcastle with the Hunter Valley position to be at the heart of the clean energy jobs boom that is being done with incredible leadership from within the community to create good jobs, to transition people who have traditionally worked in coal into clean energy and into clean tech and the industries of the future, I think we probably could have found some common ground. So I'll finish here, but I wanna say, think about that diagram and with your own work, 
I'd love you to just close your eyes for one second and think about someone who you probably should have a conversation with who's in your stretch zone, in your work. Someone maybe on the other side of a divide that if you could find some common ground, you would make more progress. And think about a plan for how you might start that conversation. Because as the saying goes, the best time to plant a tree was three decades ago, and the second best time is today. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Not often you get homework at breakfast. Um, thank you very much for such an insightful uh, conversation and for a lifelong passion. I felt tired with how much Anna has achieved. But I also feel like the world will be OK by 2050 if we've got a room full of Annas. Um, Merryweather Greenies. I like it. <laughs> um, I totally remember those days too, except I liked chemistry, but I hadn't got to the, to the bringing the coalition together yet. Um, but I think what you say around getting out of our bubble and thinking beyond is essential. We have to be, we have to have the courage to have those conversations to people whom we may not necessarily initially resonate with. We also have to listen, as you said. And I think the key piece I took out 48 elections by 2050. We've got some serious talking to do. Um, and every minute counts. So thank you, Anna, for sharing your insights, some really practical tips, because we've all got our homework. And I don't want us talking to people in here. I want us talking to people out there around how we change this agenda. We can do it. We just have to hurry up. Um, it's question uh, time now. This is the opportunity for us all to reflect on the challenges that we are collectively facing, on the insights that Anna so kindly shared with us all. Um, you can direct questions to Anna, Corinne or myself. There will be a whole number of staff from the collective team across Bush Heritage and Trust for Nature roaming around. So if you've got a question, I believe you just pop your hand up, they'll come across with a mic. Feel free to say, Anna, this question's for you, or just put it to the floor. In the history of the globe, it's one of the main drivers of the climate. It's really nearly everything. And you know that they've had the melting of the sea ice and things because it's how the world works. And I was reading for a Cambridge professor and uh, the um, Darwin said that if you have a vast amount of water and population, the climate just changes. So the protection of Antarctic is the history of what the Australian conservation has done hasn't been very well included in the Antarctic fair and it hasn't been made an, uh, enough a thing of. So how can you make it more important? Do you understand what I'm saying? It's education, really. Okay. Well, Anna just looked at me and said, you take Antarctica. And I think it's um, a really good point that you raise, and thank you for raising it. I, I think when we think to, of the circle uh, diagram that Anna shared, when we think about the situation unfolding in Antarctica right now, it pushes me right into the panic zone, to be honest with you. Um, and so I think sometimes that may be why, because um, we are, as a social species, quite good at turning away from things that hurt and they are painful uh, to digest, but equally I think it's going to be impossible to not look front on at what's happening there. Um, I know that WWF Australia, for example, send ecologists out regularly to track migratory patterns of a number of species um, that take the route from Antarctica across to our waters. And one of the hardest roles in my previous job as Chief Conservation Officer at WWF was hearing the reports back every single time. It's only over a couple of months. Each time they get on that boat, the um, whales are further and further back before they are able to monitor them um, because of the krill situation. Uh, and we're going to start hearing more and more about that. 
Equally though, there are solutions and this is where we have to face the problem so we can come up with solutions. Um, climate change action aside, and we've heard a lot of that t this morning, there are all, we're all, land, after a lot of us here work across landscapes and we understand the importance of connectivity. It matters under the waterline as well. You can invest in blue superhighways and blue corridors that are going to help increase the resilience of species that are being impacted by the very situation that you've just drawn to our attention. Um, but I'm sure we all agree uh, it's an important story to continue to tell and it's alarming um, and we need to continue to tell it in the context of also what we can do to respond uh, and build resilience in that changing ecosystem. Thank you. Um, this is a question for Anna. Thank you so much for your amazing speech. Um, what gives you hope for climate change? That is a great, that is a great segue. Um, so much actually gives me hope. I think, I mean, I obviously think about this a lot because I've been working on it for such a long time. Probably the first thing is that we have all the solutions, you know, on nature, on climate. We know what to do. It's not like we're trying to invent, you know, a cure for cancer or something that scientists are still trying to work out. We know how to reduce carbon pollution. We know how to restore landscapes. We know how to change every sector of our economy um, to be regenerative. We actually, we have those solutions already. I think the second thing is humans are actually wired for collaboration and empathy. You know, I think, are there any evolutionary biologists in the room actually? <laughs> I thought maybe there'd be one. Um, so, you know, the, initially there was these theories around survival of the fittest and kind of competition. Actually, we now know from evolutionary biology that is not correct. Humans are wired to support each other and to collaborate. And, you know, back, um, I, I guess, when w humans were not ever the strongest kind of animals on the, on the savannah, but we worked together and that is, that is how um, humanity evolved. So that is in our DNA to collaborate and to, and to empathise and to help. And then I think also we are, you know, the, the largest global network and movement of organisations working on this. There was a, some of you may have read Paul Hawkins' work, incredible author, <clears throat> a huge champion for nature and sustainability. And he asked the question um, a few years back now of how many organisations are actually working to, to solve climate change, to protect our planet. <clears throat> and he got some of his um, graduate students to help him calculate uh, and he came up, I mean, the number was extraordinary. Um, as I said, I'm not good at math, so I don't remember what it was, but it was by far the largest social movement in the history of the world, much bigger than, than any previous um, effort. So I think all of those things give me a lot of hope. And probably the last one is that things, you look again at history, my dad was a history teacher, um, so I think we can learn so much from history. You look at history and things can change fast. And situations that felt impossible can quickly shift. And I, I, I think about you know, World War II um, and in the United States you had almost overnight, like within a week, um, factories that had been used to make, I don't know, toys and other things immediately turned towards a, a war effort. Um, so societies, when they wake up to the urgencies of challenges, especially existential challenges, you know, we do have the ability to respond extremely quickly. You guys might have good additional reasons, though. I think you're, you're right in that we know what we need to do. We just need to do a lot more of it. So scale is our challenge. And secondly, speed. But it's not like we don't know what needs to be done. We've got the tools, we've got the science. We've got the desire, we just need to, you know, bring the resources and the rest of the community, which goes back, I think, to, you know, get into that panic zone of those conversations you're not so comfortable with. Um, thank you very much to Anna. Thank you very much to Anna for the talk about climate and nature. Um, climate, we know, is incredibly important. Nature, however, um, does seem to us occasionally to be a bit of a poor cousin. Um, we know very well that there are big announcements about climate, um, lots of stuff in the press. There was an announcement about a grassland earless dragon in the age two, two days ago. That is still a critically endangered animal because of habitat loss. 
The problem is that habitat loss is the, the next greatest threat, an equally great threat, and if we can manage habitat loss, then we increase the resilience of species to resisting the impacts of climate change. However, habitat loss is a sort of a business as usual thing. It doesn't tend to associate itself with big political announcements. So I guess the question is, how do we make business as usual of biodiversity management, biodiversity you know, being pres preservation of all threatened plants and animals, and preventing um, common species from becoming threatened, how do we actually get that messaging across? So I guess my question to all of you is, can you give us some advice about how we can increase the profile of this sort of business as usual work that may not be seen as quite so dramatic? I think that we, as you've pointed out, nature and, and climate go hand in hand. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the concept of planetary boundaries um, that the late Will Steffen, um, who was a great friend, had worked on to emphasise that yes, climate change is incredibly urgent, but there are many other planetary boundaries that we're also exceeding and nature and biodiversity being one of them. The fact that nature has is, is not, as you say, getting as much headlines and media attention, I actually think is a great opportunity because it means it has become less of a political football and it's actually less divisive. I think it's easier to find common ground on nature than it is on climate, in my experience. But it does mean that the work that you're doing in this space, you know, it can be transformational, but it will be much more behind the scenes. So I think in terms of advice, um, that dialogue and, and conversation and finding allies, you know, obviously we've done a lot of work with Farmers for Climate Action. Um, farmers manage 50% of Australia's land uh, with, with talking about nature and biodiversity as well as climate. So finding those people and organisations that can really shift the dial and, and starting, if, well, I'm sure you're already in conversation, but continuing those conversations and deepening that dialogue with them. I might just quickly add, and thank you so much for the um, question. It's another really, really important one. Um, it wasn't that many years ago that we weren't even seeing anywhere. In, I mean, I know we need more climate action and we need it faster, but you're right, we're starting to see momentum. Um, and there's a lot of people, including myself, worried about leave, leaving biodiversity behind. I have sat at Parliament House in the Prime Minister's office and had his advisers say, I think we took the climate election too literally. I think we really think the climate election when people were voting was just about climate. But actually, everyday Australians thought they were voting for nature, for biodiversity as well. So I think the question we've got to ask ourselves, and, and I'll put it to the room because I really don't have the answer, but it's something I think of often, is how do we make the next federal election, which is in May, next year, around then, how do we make that a climate and nature election and leave no room for doubt that when people are casting their votes, they're voting uh, in favour of action for both? I think that is something we need to look at as well, but again, in a way that is not divisive uh, and in a way that is solution focused and very centre forward. It's something we're thinking about as well. And I think the, the last piece is just keep up the great work on, on the dragon. Uh, it's by bringing the visibility of these species that you can actually get that coalition on the ground and then at a political level to actually work on it. Um, I think it is about how do you do sustainable development within, you know, within Melbourne and that will need to look different and we've already shifted a lot. What does the future need to look like and how does Melbourne and how does it grow in a sustainable fashion happen? We've had a few questions come in from online, so just going to read one of those now. This is from Marion. How do we reinvigorate existing organisations that have and continue to do good work? How do we avoid diluting effort and funding? The partnership between Trust for Nature and Bush, Bush Heritage is a good example of partnering to strengthen different aspects of the problem. Look, I... Trust for Nature is over 50 years old, so I'm going to say you can re keep reinvigorating. The issues have never been more important. But I think coming at from uh, a sector outside, I'd actually come from social services and prior to that banking. What has absolutely surprised me here is the level of collaboration in this sector. Um, Rachel and I see, uh, as when I was working with Heather or at ALCA, 
we're, we're about how do we solve the problem. No one organisation can do it. And it's when we put our various strengths. So we might be doing covenants. Rachel might be actually purchasing land. Then we'll talk to Greening Australia and they'll put the trees on it. Or we'll go, we're doing a partnership with Cassinia, and then there's government in. It's that meshing of all of those different skill sets that will actually give us a chance at saving these ecosystems. I'll, I'll leave it at that, and not, but just um, add, I think it's less about the reinvigoration of energy because we can all feel today we're not lacking energy in this room, in our sector. There's passion, there's enthusiasm, there's vision, um, there's collaboration. We, how do we reinvigorate or even find new funding streams that will take us to the scale that we need and get that prioritisation happening as well. That's, that's, that's going to be key. That will start to get some real um, reinvigoration. Hi all, it's um, Tamara from Buy Nothing New Month and the new Joneses. Thank you for today. I think my question is probably to you, Anna, and it kind of cuts back to the, not the question we've just had, but the previous topic. What do we do now when um, there is now a disconnect or an argument saying, yes, we need renewables, but what about the whales? What on earth do we do with the conservatives and people who are now saying we want to pre preserve biodiversity, therefore we don't need, we don't want renewables? I find that one quite mind-blowing. Yes, I will talk about it, but I'm sure Rachel has some ideas as well. Um, also, massive shout out to the new Jones. Like that is so great. And if people haven't, you know, come across it, definitely look it up because it's I'm such a fan. Um, I think, yeah, on the offshore wind specifically, this is certainly something that my team and I have been looking at closely and working on with other community organisations that are in those areas. There is a lot of misinformation online about the impact that offshore wind will have on whale migration. I mean, climate change is a much bigger threat to whales. You know, whales have sonar, they can also see. There are definite uh, ways that you can build offshore wind that are going to be like fine for whales. So this is, but I also understand where those communities um, that are seeing this information and, and spreading it, like they, they care deeply, of course, as we all do, for nature and for our marine ecosystems and for whales. And so if you see that online, you c it's really easy to go into panic and go, well, we have to stop this. Um, and I don't want to say the same thing in the answer to every question, but um, it is about having a genuine conversation with those communities. And I think it's interesting to compare. Um, look, I'm not from Victoria, but from what I have seen and, and heard from people on the ground, the Victorian offshore wind zone, where there is an actual proponent, like a company that's building it, that can put out information about where they're going to be, how big they're going to be, what the impact will be. Um, there's been a lot less community angst because there's genuine information. Now, in New South Wales, with the Illawarra offshore wind zone um, and the Hunter offshore wind zone, there's no proponent. Um, there's no actual developer saying, like, this is what it's going to be like. These will be the impacts. There's just this idea that there will be an offshore zone. When you don't have information out there, people can fill the void with misinformation. And so I think that like, there needs to be much better community consultation done. And I think that government needed to do a better job and can now catch up, but we're starting from a way behind on that. So that's specifically on offshore wind. And then on the broader issue of nature and climate and the intersection where we have to build so much more renewable energy. I was reading a really interesting paper on this recently um, out of the States and it was talking about um, it was talking about we, d we no longer have climate denial, you know, in the majority of our community, but we have trade-off denial. To build the amount of renewable energy that we need to build is going to affect our landscapes. That is the reality if we're going to avoid, avoid climate tipping points. Now, we have to do it in the best way that we can and government needs to have really, as much as they can, strong standards for both community consultation and protecting nature. But we are going to see huge changes in Australia's agricultural communities um, and, and in our nature. So that's something that we all have to grapple with. We can't pretend it's not happening. Um, we have to engage in it and shape it. And obviously the federal um, EPBC Act, Environment Protection, Biodiversity, Conservation reforms that the federal government is working on at the moment, like that is absolutely at the heart of that conversation. So people should be engaged in that process. 
I'm mindful of time, so I might say one more question if, Megan, you want to keep us to time. Um, but I'm, on that one, tomorrow, we also need to work with more amazing marketeers like yourself um, and hopefully make sure that nature positive becomes a lot more than just a strap line, I would say. So we've got one more question that's come in online. There's actually been many questions online, which we haven't been able to get to, which is great. Um, we've got a question from Liz. How do we shift the emphasis from constant revised planning and targets to more resources to empower and make things happen? I th My sense is it's really around reframing what the end game needs to be like. And I think thinking big rather than in the boundaries, I think one of the observations I've seen is we've done very species specific work often. We actually need to look at what is the future state that we're wanting and the species fit within that. Because then you start looking at bigger resource levels and you can start to be creative as to where they need to come from. And I think that's the other piece is resources can't all come from government or some philanthropic funds. We've got to think differently. There's whole lots of different financial mechanisms. There's fee-for-service stuff. I think we've just got to throw it up all in the air for a seismic change, not just an incremental one. Okay. Okay. Um, it's, an, it's an important question. Innovative financing is going to have to continue to be one we keep coming back to. Um, and Whiteboards. And, and, and I'm going to say it because I know I'm in day 20 of the CEO role, but each of you are here today because in some way, shape or form, there is no doubt you have supported either Bush Heritage or Trust for Nature, organisations working on protecting what we simply cannot risk losing further. Um, I think we all just keep throwing our weight behind that protection agenda whilst rising above and looking also at the big questions around how we start to shift some of the key paradigms to get us to scale on reducing threats. Easier said than done, I know, but um, there lies the challenge for us. I am very mindful um, that everyone's going, did I win a prize? <laughs> and uh, I would like for Corinne and I to have our Oprah moment. <laughs> so if you would allow us to do that, Anna, thank you thank so you. much for sharing your wisdom further. So, so that draws the final morning's formalities to an end. There's definitely some good, some good stuff here. Um, so I just want to shout out a real thank you to our keynote, Anna Rose. Um, she's personally provided me with a lot of inspiration. Also, big shout out to the sponsors. Without you, this would be very hard to do. So TBH, Cassinia, the team the Cassinia team over here with Paul and the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation. Thank you so much. These things don't happen alone. And on that note, a really big shout out to um, the Trust for Nature and Bush Heritage teams. Megan, Josie, Sam, James, I think, again, I don't know who else to list, but there is a whole plethora of people who make this thing happen. Uh, Rachel and I just get to look at the bits at the end. Thank you. Your time and attention and care makes this a real success. Well done, team. Well done. Okay. I am going to bring formalities to a close. I also want to acknowledge that team um, who Corinne just called out. Every year they ask you what you thought of this event and every year they try to make it better. And one of the things that you have told us is that you love the time to just build on the conversations, to get to know each other better. And so there is another 30 minutes for you to do that, to hang around and to keep the conversations rolling. Thank you all again so much for getting up early this morning, for squeezing this breakfast into your no doubt jam-packed schedules. It, I hope, has been a reminder to us all because it never hurts to just pause and reflect on, yes, there are an enormous amount of challenges in our world right now. There's plenty to keep us up at night and push us into that panic zone if we allow it. But we are not alone. Um, there is an incredible number of people online here in this room and others that want to be in this room um, and beyond who are absolutely committed to the to rising to the challenges that we're all rising to. So please, thank you so much. Please continue to 
absolutely support the mission and vision around protecting and healthy country forever. And we'll see you next year. We will. At Rod Laver Arena, apparently. <laughs>